Hello, and thank you for joining us tonight. We're going to be studying through, uh, continuing our study through the book of Judges. And tonight we're going to be looking at a man named Gideon, someone that probably the Israelites may have thought the least likely person to deliver them. And sometimes God, uh, I believe he gets the most glory by looking at bringing out strength through our weakness. We, uh, when we think we've got something to really offer God, we think that, you know, I can do God a favor by doing this. Uh, usually, I believe that's the person God cannot use. I think the person that God uses the most is someone who sees that there, there, there's weakness and that apart from God, I can't do this. And so you see this in the life of Gideon. Gideon is someone that we see in Hebrews 11 in the book of uh, the, the faith chapter someone that we see about his great faith. But if you look at this story, in the beginning, you'll see someone who didn't have great faith. You'll see someone that didn't start out very well, but his faith increased. And uh, then toward the end of his life, you see someone who, though he had a strong start, or maybe maybe a little bit weak, weak faith, then he helped deliver his people Israel. And then he didn't finish... Uh, as strongly as you may hope, uh, but uh, definitely things we can learn from the life of Gideon. So I want you to turn to uh, Judges chapter 6. We'll look at this judge. Uh, now, just to be aware, Deborah was the judge before Gideon and must have been an amazing leader. Uh, this lady that you rarely see women as leaders in scripture, but she led Israel uh, in battle, and though Barak was the was the commander, uh, he he even told Deborah, I, "I won't go unless you go with me." So, through their conquest of their enemies, Israel saw uh, forty years of peace uh, during this time, but. As you see over and over and over in the book of Judges and elsewhere elsewhere through Scripture, we see that they go back to following gods, especially this god called Baal and Asherah. Uh, Baal, uh, well, what happened, They, they the Israelites went into the land of Canaan, and as they go into this land of Canaan, the, the land is more fertile than anything they'd ever seen. It's very fertile ground. The Canaanites said the land was so fertile because uh, of Baal and Asherah, the fertility gods, or especially Asherah. Uh, Asherah was a female goddess, and then Baal was a uh, male god. Again, false gods. But it was something that people had made up. And the actually Asherah was the mother of Baal. And they ended up becoming married. I guess how gods get married and things like that. Baal was a superior god. He dominated all the other gods. He was someone had a human body, but the head of a bull. And there was what you saw in, in, the, in the Israelites. Sometimes they would just turn to Baal and Asherah. They'd put up uh, altars and have these Asherah poles. And sometimes they would even mix their God, the one true God, with this uh, false religion, the Baal religion. And it's, it's just like you see them go back and forth. There was uh, also uh, a lot of um, immorality associated with this, sexual immorality associated with this religion. And so uh, you also saw the on the fertility part of the land, Oftentimes there was child sacrifice. We will sacrifice the firstborn uh, son in order to have fertility uh, in our lives, in, in our gardens, in our lives. And so it was a just an abominable practice before our holy God. And it's amazing that the people would see God work. And then sometimes it'd be seven years, eight years, 10 years, 40 years later, and they would just turn back to the false teachings. So, uh, but but we see this in our own life sometimes where you see God's people follow him and go back, just kind of a roller coaster ride. And God doesn't want that for our lives. I think he just wants a, a continual growth 
pattern in our life where we grow more and more in our walk with him. All of that is an introduction. Let's jump into this passage, Judges chapter 6, and I'll try to put this on the screen. Hopefully you'll be able to see this, and I've highlighted a few things here. It says, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. So, again, is God is, I think, not repaying them for their evil as much as he's trying to draw them back through judgment. He's trying to draw them back. He's trying not to pay them back, but to win them back. In verse 2, because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with the livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them on their camels. They invaded the land and ravaged it, or to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. So you see that they have to get to the bottom again in order to call out to God. They, they go through this oppression for years and years before they call out to God. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and others would just... They, they, can you imagine planting crops and... The, uh, they 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 work so hard to, to to plant their gardens and their 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 all, all that they had and then these invaders the enemies would come in and just just totally destroy everything that they had and so there came a point where they say you know uh, we are we've had enough and we're going to call out to God and that's what they did and you would think God would say you know what don't call to me now. You know what? You 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 chose this path for yourself. You you uh, you'll walk down this road by yourself. You're not going to get my help. But God didn't do that. A merciful God, who loved His chosen people, God reached out to them when they humbled themselves and they called out to God. In uh, verse seven, it says, uh, "When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, He sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says.'" I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hands of the Egyptians. And I'm sorry, I thought I had it on there. Let me pull it over. I rescued you from the hands of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. Then, in verse 11, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash, the Abbey's right, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now, the thing is, Gideon was not a mighty warrior. He was this uh, probably young farm boy. Who was, who was not anything like a mighty warrior, but God saw potential that, that Gideon himself did not see. Uh, pardon me, my Lord. And many people believe this is, is Jesus appearing at this time. Uh, it, could be a, it could be an angel. It could be Jesus. We don't know for certain, but it appears that it could even be Jesus here. Verse 13, pardon me, Lord. Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they, they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hands of the Midianite. And it, it's just amazing that they would say this, that, Lord, you abandoned us. The Lord did not abandon them. They abandoned the Lord. And when you abandon the Lord in your life, there's going to be consequences for that. And the Israelites found this out time and time again. Verse 14, the Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of the Midian's hands. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. So, you know, Manasseh say, you know, I'm sorry, Gideon say, I'm of the weakest 
family. And in my family, I'm the weakest one in my entire family. The Lord answered, I will be with you. And you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon replied, if now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Gideon went inside, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour he made a bread without yeast, putting the meat in a basket and its broth in a pot. He brought them out and offered them under the oak. The angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock, and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You're not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord and called it the Lord is Peace. To this day it stands in Oprah of the Abbey's Rice. Verse 25. That same night the Lord said to him, Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on the top of this height. Using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. So Gideon, you see his faith increasing here. Uh, so Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. In the morning... The people of the town got up, and there was Baal's altar demolished with the Asherah pole beside it cut down and the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar. And they asked each other, who did this? And when they carefully investigated, they were told Gideon, son of Joash, did it. And the people of the town demanded of Joash, bring out your son. He must die because he has broken down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. But Joash replied to the hostile crowd around him, Are you going to plead Baal's cause? Are you trying to save him? Whoever fights for him shall be put to death by morning. If Baal really is God, he can defend himself when someone breaks down his altar. So because Gideon broke down Baal's altar, they gave him the name Jerubbaal that day, saying, Let Baal contend with him. Now we go further. Verse 33 says, Now all the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples joined forces and crossed over the Jordan and camped in the valley of Jezreel. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, summoning the Abizurites to follow him. He sent messengers throughout Manasseh, calling them to arms, and also into Asher, Zebulon, and Naphtali, so that they too went up to meet them. And then Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew only on the fleece and, I, and all the ground is dry, then I will know that you saved Israel by my hand, as you said. And that is what happened. Gideon rose early in the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowl full of water. So, folks, this is not something to try for us to try to to follow a pattern. This shows lack of faith. Uh, he had some faith. He had little faith, and his faith was growing. But this is not some type of example for us to follow. This shows faith being built in him, and he didn't have faith, and God was not angry with him. But then this does not show us how for us to, to follow God. Because in verse 39 it says, then, then Gideon said to God, Do not be angry with me. Let me make just one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece. But this time, make the fleece dry and let the ground be covered with dew. And that night, God did so. Only the fleece was dry and all the ground was covered with dew. So God showed him. And again, God wasn't angry. And you may think that there's other times in Scripture you see God uh, maybe come down hard on someone who would do such a thing. But, but God does know Gideon's heart. God does know that this young man is, is the one that he's calling to rescue his people. And so 
again, not a pattern for us to follow regarding faith at this point, but I think you will see that to start in chapter 7 as we move into there. It says, Early in the morning, Zerubbabel, that is Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands, or Israel will boast against me. He said, You know what? If you do it in your own strength, or matter of fact, let's go on further. He says, My own strength has saved me. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left with 10,000 remained. So he said, you know, there's too many men. You will take credit. If I let you go in there with this many men, you will take, you'll take credit for it. So uh, he tells them, anybody who has fear, you can turn back now. And, you know, you almost see like the Alamo, they... they take the sword and make a line that says cross over if you're fear. Or, you know, I don't remember if they cross over or didn't cross over uh, because of fear, but, but, but not a single man in the Alamo uh, retreated. But uh, in the uh, fight with Gideon, he lost uh, 22,000 immediately. And 10,000 who were men of, uh, they, were, they were pretty brave men, said, we'll fight. We're not scared. We're going to go out and do this. So verse 4, Says, but the Lord said to Gideon, there's still too many men. Now, they're going against an army that's much larger. Even if they had 32,000, they were going against an army much bigger than them. He said, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will thin them out for you there. And then, this is going down to verse 9. So, verse 5, I'm sorry, verse 5. So, Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel down to drink. So if you drink like a dog, you're going to be separated on one side. And if you if you get down on your knee and cup your hand or, or get down on your knees to drink, uh, you'll be separated. Verse 6, 300 of them drank from cup hands, hands laughing like dogs. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. Again, you see Gideon's faith here. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the 300 who took over the provisions and trumpets of the others. If you go into battle with 300 men, you've got faith. And I believe Gideon had faith. God had spoken to him. He believed the word of God. He'd already cut down the Asherah pole and destroyed the temple, and destroyed the, um, the altar of... Um, he, he destroyed the altar of Baal, and all those things could have cost him his life, probably likely would have cost him his life had God not protected him. So he's now down to 300 men. He's going to face this uh, monster of an army the Midianites had, uh, who had been just wreaking havoc on his people and just destroying their crops and just taunting them and destroying everything they had. They were subject to them, and they needed someone to rise up and be a leader and deliver them. And God called the most unlikely person in Gideon to do that. So let's read on just a little bit more, and then we'll, we'll look at this passage. But I think it's important that we read uh, this passage uh, in most of its entirety to understand what God is doing here. So uh, now the camp of Gideon, Midian lay below him in the valley. Verse 9, During that night the Lord said to Gideon, Get up, go down against the camp, because I'm going to give it into your hands. If you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura and listen to what they are saying. Afterwards, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So it's amazing. You still see there's a little bit lack of faith, but, but he's got faith to go in with 300 men, but he's still fearful, and I think I would be too. So, so he and Pura, his servant, went down to the outpost of the camp, which that takes some faith to do that, wouldn't it? Verse 12, the Midianites that... Uh, the Malachites and other eastern peoples had settled in the valley, thick as locusts. Their camels could no more be counted than the sand on the seashore. So thousands and thousands and thousands of men. Verse 13, Gideon arrived, just as a man was telling a friend in his dream. I had a dream, he said. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the midnight camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. 
his friend responded, This can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down and worshipped. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, Get up! The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. Dividing the 300 men into three companies, he placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. Watch me, he told them. Follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. And when I and all who are with me blow our trumpets and be like ram's horns or something like that, then from all around the camp blow yours and shout for, for the Lord and for Gideon. Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just as they had ch ch changed the guard. They blew their trumpets and broke the jars that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars, grasping the torches in their hands and holding uh, in their right hands the trumpets they were to blow. They shouted, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon, while each man held his position around the camp. All the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. When the three hundred trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. The army fled to Beth uh, Shitha, toward Zerah, and as far as the border, Abel, Maloa, Mahola, near Tabith. And what you see here, the, these uh, men, uh, the enemy, the uh, the Midianites and others, God just used 300 men really just to create chaos. They didn't even have to hardly do anything. The, they, the enemies almost killed each other, and then they pursued them. Uh, the Midianite leaders, Oreb and Zeb, were, were killed, and God was able to deliver uh, this strong, powerful enemy into the hands of uh, Gideon and the people of Israel. What can we learn from this? There's, there's, there is a lot to be learned, and, and I'm not going to take a whole lot of time left. Uh, we've read a long passage, but just to let you know a couple things. One, it starts with a little faith. Uh, God has plans for us, and sometimes we miss so much because of lack of faith. But Jesus told us if we had faith as much as a mustard seed, that we could move mountains. And he had little faith. You know, at the beginning, he said, well, let's do the fleece test. And then over and over, we see little things in his life where, I'm not sure, Lord, you guys show me something. But he had, he had enough faith to trust in God. And see, God often calls the weak, people who know that apart from God, they cannot do it. Uh, it's really hard for God to use people who think they're something, think they're very talented. Uh, because when we do that, we do things in the flesh. But when we realize our weakness and say, God, I need you. I can't do this apart from you, Lord. You're going to have to do it. That's when you see God work in your life. God may have called you to something. It seems like a giant task. It may be you witnessing to a neighbor or a friend or a family member. It could be something even in your mind much bigger than that. But the thing is, when you realize you cannot do it, that's when God will take over and do things that you could never imagine. Gideon could never imagine uh, taking on the entire Midianite uh, army and the Amalekites with 300 men and conquering them. That was a God-sized task, not a, not a Gideon-sized task. When Gideon looked at his own flesh and his own abilities, he knew that he couldn't do that. But again, when we do that, and we, we try to do things in the flesh, we, we, won't, be, we won't be able to accomplish anything. Uh, the other thing we see is that a little faith will grow. Uh, like that mustard seed, it grows into a very large plant. So that little faith grew, but it, we, we went from 32,000 men to 10,000 men to 300 men. Uh, and just to understand, it doesn't take much to be used by God. Oftentimes we think we have to have this or that in order to, to, to serve the Lord. You, you see... Uh, Sometimes we, you know, I, we need we need we need a new sound system. You know, if we don't get this sound system, we're not going to be able to use the Lord. Be used by the Lord. We we have to have a new church van, or, or we need a new building. And if we don't get this new building, we're not going to be able to reach our community. Um, we need we need this much money. We, we 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 need more materials. We need 
we need more leaders. We need we need more of this or more of that. And and you think about the commission, the great commission that God gave uh, to the disciples in Matthew 28. Uh, we also see Acts 1 8. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and other most parts of the world. And he gave them the, that commission. It was 11 guys. And, you know, they probably could say, you know, they didn't know these things, but we, we don't have an airplane, Lord. We don't, we don't even have a ship to get across the, these countries. We, we don't have a car. We don't, have a, we don't even have a bicycle. We don't have a motorcycle. Uh, Lord, we, we don't have a house. We don't, we don't have money to do these things. We, we don't have technology. Lord, we just don't have the things we need. He said, I know what you have. You have me. And that's all you need to accomplish the task that I've given to you. You, you don't need all these things. Now, God can use things or, or something. He's given those to us. But sometimes we think we have to have this. We have to have the 32,000 men or more in order to accomplish God's will. I, I do believe that sometimes, uh, you know, I've been in Baptist church most all my life. And I, I think it's probably true of other churches, not just Baptists, but sometimes somebody will print a new book and we'll, we'll want to follow that book to the T and say, okay, okay, this book's come out. We're going to model our church after this book or this new seminar that's going on or this, that, this, that. And this church, God's using this church this way, so we're going to copy that church and we're going to do exactly like they do. And sometimes what we do we follow another church or we follow a book when God says, hey, those are good things. I'm using them because I led those people to that. But I did not lead you to copy them. I want you to seek me, not seek a book, not seek a, a, a different church. But I want you to seek me, and as you seek me, I will lead you. And I think that's what God wants us to do in order uh, to, to reach reach others, reach the world, uh, and, and just really to follow Him and what God's called us to do. Uh, you have, you and I, we have everything we need to accomplish what God has called us to do. And we often think that we need something else. We, I need this. You know, Again, I, we need this building, or we need this vehicle, or we need this or that. And, and, and it's like, man, if I just had that, I could serve the Lord. God says, you got everything you need. For me to accomplish what I want to accomplish in you today, if you'll trust in me, you'll see him work. And I think we'll see also in this passage that God's way is different than our way. Our way would have been, we'd probably look and say 32,000, that's not enough. We need to double that. We need 64,000, and we need more swords, and we need more whatever else. Our, I mean, they didn't have artillery, but I guess whatever they could find. We need more camels. We need... We need more slingshots or bow and arrows. We need everything, spears. We need everything we can to come against these people. And, you know, that'd be something completely in the flesh, and they would have probably been devastated if they'd came in that way and done that. God's way was completely different. You go in and and and, and really can and just blow your horn and you'll confuse the people. Kind of like you look at uh, when they came up to... Um, uh, what is it? Uh, Jericho. They came to Jericho. They didn't attack Jericho. They they marched around Jericho, and the walls fell down. God's ways are different than our ways, and uh, sometimes we try to make things happen. And and you know, again, I, I've got to have that. You know, if we can do this, we can follow this book. We can do these things, and and we think. Well, we just try to ma manufacture something instead of saying, God saying, whoa, whoa, be still. Why don't you seek me first? You seek me with all your heart. And then watch me lead you in my timing. And he can do so much more than what, what we could do. One of the sad things is, is that Gideon was led by faith and God used him. I believe Gideon's in heaven today. But there was a time after this, he did not finish strong. And we'll see that probably next time. We'll look at that uh, probably next time. He didn't finish strongly. And uh, we can def definitely learn with that. But, but that doesn't diminish how God used him. How God, God used a man of faith to lead 300 men into battle. 
and do things. He, he was the smallest, the weakest tribe, the weakest uh, man in his tribe, he says. And God used him in a great, great way. What can God do in your life? You know, if you, you really always want to put application to something that we see. And so looking at the application of this text, for us to never say, well, God can't use me. You know, I just don't have anything to offer the Lord. Uh, that is um, a lack of faith and lack of trust in our lives when we say that. God can use you, and God can do incredible things in your life when we just put our faith and trust in Him. I hope you can realize that today and through the life of Gideon and how God used and worked in him and how He wants to use us today. He wants us to, to win people to Christ. He wants us to equip them in their walk with God. And then and then just live a light, uh, live the life of, of a light, a life of love, where we love God and where we love others. I hope this passage and this teaching has been a blessing to you. May God use it in your life. Don't take it and let it just go away, but use it to be part of your life and for God to grow you uh, in, in your walk with Him. Let me pray for us and, and then we'll conclude. Dear Father, we thank you for this time. Lord, may you teach us how to live and thank you for this life, that the life of faith, Lord, that we see in the life of Gideon. May you increase our faith, and may you call us to, to things that seem impossible, Lord, but with you all things are possible. Help us never to lack in faith. Lord, it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us, and may God bless you.